welcome to the second module of the DNet tutorials. In this module, we will go over the possibilities of DNet's 1D database. In order to fully optimize the use of 1D database and using anthropometric analysis in your design process, it is important to realize a few things. First of all, most anthropometric parameters are normally distributed over a population. This goes mostly for bony structures as opposed to body parts containing more muscle and fat. This normal distribution makes anthropometric data a great tool for tailoring your product to your target group, without the need for extensive physical prototyping and making sure that all targeted users are able to use the product as intended. That said, selecting your target group beforehand is important to decide on your population. There are different design intentions to consider, ranging from design for a single user to design for all. Decide for your own case which part of the population you need to get included. Additionally, it should be realized which product features should be optimized to which body measures. A doorknob, for example, could be designed based on elbow height. Lastly, try to clearly define your target group. Are you designing for adults, children or elderly? What age range do you consider and is gender important? By selecting the right population for your study, you can prevent misfit of your product and the user. This child, for example, is sitting on a chair and a table that are too high for her, making her have to sit on her knees and pulling up her shoulders. Smart designers could think of a solution like this. So how can we use the 1D database of DNet? Let's go to the tool. This automatically opens up an introduction page for the 1D database. Take some time to read this through. Now we can go to the actual tool. On the left here, you can see a list of populations. If you want to learn more about the populations, just click on it and select more. And you will find a description here. Select a population that is closest to your target group. For example, Dutch children. You can select either this one from 1993, but at the bottom we can also find one from 2019. Now it's time to select an age range and a gender. Now moving on to the measures. You can see that some of the measures are excluded from the list and grayed out. That means that those measures are not inside the database that you selected. If your intention was to know more about the feet of children, for example, you could always decide to try another database. For example, this one. And you can see that for this one, data about the food of children is available. If you still cannot find your data within the databases of DNet, it is possible that the data can be found in another source. In that case, I would recommend you to explore this list to find what you're looking for. In case you're studying wheelchair users, maybe you could study this source. Or more data can be found in this source. Now that I selected two databases, you can see at the bottom that both databases are taken into account in your study. But we haven't selected any measures yet. So now it's time to select a measure that is most related to your study. For example, foot length. If you wish to know more about how this is measured, 
Just click on the word and you'll find the description. If you cannot find your dimension in this graphic illustration, click table and you can see that there are actually more measures available. For example, foot circumference. Now moving on to the bottom of this page, and you can see that both of my selected populations are now illustrated in this table. However, for my first population, there is no data available of my measure, foot length. This table illustrates the foot length, mean and standard deviation of my population of Dutch children age two mixed. I can always add another age group, providing me with more information. Clicking on the tab single measure opens up a normal curve or Gauss curve. But before we go into more details of this normal curve and the tool, let's first discuss the variables that we're dealing with. The two most prominent parameters in these kinds of studies are the mean and standard deviation. But we're also dealing with percentiles and z values to explore the spread and variability of a measure inside a population. In some cases, you might be interested in the extreme measurements, such as P1 and P99. Or you might want to know the percentile of a specific data point. The normal curve, or Gauss curve, illustrates the value of x on the x-axis and the sample count, annotated with the letter n, on the y-axis. For example, a range of shoe sizes would be divided on the x-axis and the frequency of each shoe size in the population is displayed on the y-axis. The total sample size is annotated with a capital N. The average or mean value can be calculated by summing up all the values of x divided by the total sample size. The standard deviation is an important parameter to explain variability inside a normal distribution and can be defined by the horizontal distance from the mean to the inflection point. The formula describing the standard deviation is based on the measurement values, the mean value, and the sample counts per value of x. To find percentiles or z values, we often use this table. You might want to find out which measurement value lies at 25% on the left side of the curve. In this case, we would always use the z value of 0 0.67 and apply this to the formula PY equals the mean value minus the z value, so 0 0.67, multiplied by the standard deviation. Note here that PY represents the measurement value that is associated with the percentile Y, so not the percentile itself. By using the formula of PQ, you can calculate the percentile values on the right side of the curve. Using these two formulas, you can for example calculate the extreme measurement values of P1 to P99 or P5 to P95. But in some cases, you might want to find out a p-value that is not in this list. In that case, we will translate the formula to calculate the z-value by using the standard deviation multiplied by the p-value minus the mean. With the standard deviation and mean value given for most data sets, you can find the z-value for a specific data point. And using the same table, we can find the percentile associated with that z-value. If you want to read more about the theory of this part of DNet, I would refer you to the following books. You can also find more information and more literature on the DNet page, How It Works. Back in DNet, you can now explore the possibilities of this interactive gas curve. You can use the slider to select a percentile of which you want to know the measure value. You can also fill it in manually. As you can see, the P1 value of this measure is equal to 
169 millimeters and is located at minus 2.33 times the standard deviation away from the mean. But we already knew this from our standardized table. You can also use the tab Set Percentiles to create an overview of relevant percentiles for your project. Or the tab Set Measurements for an overview of relevant measures. If you wish to combine more populations in your study, go to the Populations list, scroll down and click on Combined Populations. Click New Population, give it a title, and select the populations to include, for example, this one and this one. You can now move on to select a measure. Maybe your exact measurement is not in a list, but perhaps you could combine it. For example, the elbow height of someone sitting in a wheelchair. I know the popliteal height and I know the elbow height from the sitting surface. By clicking Combine Measures, New Measure, Click on Sitting, selecting both popliteal height and elbow height sitting. They are now combined and I can use this information for my study. To apply this tool to our case study, I'm interested in measures of the head. By clicking Table, I can see all the available measures. And now I decide I'm most interested in head circumference. On the left now, I can see the databases that include this measure. For example, Dutch adults, DINA 2004. Sliding this bar immediately tells me that the head circumference varies between about 520 and 610, with two standard deviations away from the mean which is quite a lot. I can get the same results with this too. But I'm also interested in the variation of head depth. By checking this box, that measure is now added to my table. I could now use this information to design a bicycle helmet to fit my population from the P5 to P95. But I should note that I'm excluding 10% of my population. Additionally, I can make an overview of existing bicycle helmet sizes using set measurements. This example uses head circumference values of 500 to 620 with intervals of 20 mm. This turns out to include a large part of the selected population. But when including a population of children, you'll notice that the smallest 50% of this group will need smaller helmets. At the end of the study, two things should be considered. Most data is collected by taking measurements from subjects. But in some studies, length and weight are obtained by a survey. Results of those studies are often tending towards the average. Besides that, when analyzing a single measure for product sizing, it should be considered that other measures could be correlated. Maybe you should make other adjustments. This question will be covered in the next module. Thanks for watching.